Hello there, my name is uh, Kelly Harlton and I'm here today with uh, a couple of my gurus, Randy Bruzma behind the camera over there and uh, Morris Kohansky, uh, my, uh, my uh, ultimate teacher. Um, so we're going to do a fun little video here in the next few minutes. Uh, I'm going to title it uh, Doing Things Backwards. Um, I'm going to let Morris um, talk about a, a say, a more or less sort of a saying that he has that in relation to how we sometimes do things we can do things differently and get better results. <laughs> yeah, uh, notice that in the issue of observing people, you uh, get a, 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 a insights every once in a while in the way people see things. For example, a common way to light fire is to use an inexpensive hacksaw blade that happens to be the right sort of metal and everything to use as a striker for lighting fire. So you take a hacksaw blade and break it into four pieces and then uh, you find that uh, it's an inexpensive uh, striker because you can get um, ten blades for eighty cents at Princess Auto at one time. And until you mention to the learner that the teeth don't work, they, there's a connection. They don't give it a second thought and say, ah, what works better? the smooth back of the blade or the toothy side. And you have to eventually, because uh, I can't even recall ever that when you give these blades out that a student spontaneously would <laughs> stop and say, oh, I have two choices. Given two choices, there are many things like that. You usually end up picking up the wrong one. <laughs> so, so when you come, like I say, that's where the first insight comes. When you do something, and you work it out and it seems to be working for you, uh, don't neglect to see if the opposite, because you might just find the opposite of what you come up with will work far better. And we're going to give some examples of exactly that. <laughs> so some of this stuff uh, folks are pretty familiar with, but it, it, it's fair to have them lumped in this demonstration because, well, it just makes sense. So the issue with using a saw always is we, we have to figure out a way to hold our material stable to be safe. And then once we figure out how to hold our material stable, then we can use the saw to cut it. But the alternate to that is, no, let's figure out a way to hold the saw stable, and then let's move the material. So if I take something that, uh, as long as I've got the ability to hold it with my hands, and if I find a balance point, I can simply use the saw in this fashion. So this could be up against a tree trunk, by the way, or it could be on the ground stable as you can have it, find the balance point, and I, and I can handle stuff uh, 10 or 15 feet long as long as I can put my hands on it. The weight of the wood actually provides about the right amount of pressure for cutting, so it actually works very well. Nice and smooth. When you get close you can just break it of course. And then so you cut in half, you cut in half, you cut in half, so it works with a buck saw, it works with your conventional saw. Conventional Swede saw. On there. So. Again, against a tree trunk in your midsection, or if you don't mind standing a little bit convoluted. So in half, and then in half again. Very smooth, nice way to be in control. You can even do it with uh, arbor saws in smaller pieces. It's always a challenge to figure out how to hold things. Once you twig onto this, so a good example of what this is used for is cutting small pieces for uh, the bush cooker. Because you tend to work with stuff that long. So a little of the wrist rolling. Much easier than trying to manage with no place to hold and uh, risking a, a saw cut. Another example, a fun example. So often in the bush we're caught with this, uh, uh, always having to split material for whether it be for fire making or other. And um, it's great if you have a chopping block. I happen to have one here, but often that's not the case. You're in snow. We look for a down tree or we're down a tree and we'll put it down and make a, a surrogate chopping block that way. Um, there is techniques 
but you don't need much of a chopping block. For example, we call that a contact splitting, so it's holding your stock really tight to your matrix words. So we're going to hold the saw. I'm going to put our wood on there. We're simply going to uh, check the uh, fairly efficient way to split wood. So now no chopping block is needed. Like I've done this in the snow, tramp it down. Try something a little more aggressive here. Now at some point you can use the ground. You will, you'll not hurt your axe by hitting, the, uh, hitting it with the baton. There's no, there's no harm to be done hitting on their blade. It's just the same as uh, hitting it into wood. Don't miss and hit your toes. Better to hit your toe with uh, a baton though than the axe. So in some regards. <laughs> What a beautiful way to make kindling. Idea sure, still. If you had a double bitted axe, drive them with a whole bit of stump. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> double bitted axe would be. Uh... That's pretty handy. When making feather sticks, in our mind, we want to hold the stick and we want to move the knife. We find a lot of times in our courses, if somebody's having an issue getting nice feathers, well, we have them do the opposite. We have them hold the knife and move the stick. The way we have them do that is we uh, have them brace it against their thigh, set the angle of the knife, and they simply pull the stick like this, and they'll often get the most gorgeous feathers. A friend of ours, uh, another Morris student named the Dragon, invented this, so we have to give him credit. So we call it the Dragon, the Dragon technique, in tongue and cheek, because we're dragging the material across our knee. A variation on that, of course. You'll see this on the internet too a little bit. As we actually plant the knife in, and then with a little practice, this, some, this takes a little bit more practice. But in terms of speed, especially if you're just making coarse feather sticks, which, by the way, isn't always a bad thing. When you talk about speed to coal establishment on a fire, sometimes we make too many gorgeous, nice, beautiful, fine feather sticks, but this is the stuff that actually falls, uh, it creates, uh, gets you to coal establishment. This is for lighting. This is for getting to coal establishment. With practice, you can make them as fine as you want, but uh, you make copious amounts of uh, Morris says a good percentage of the reason that you carry a knife in the bush is for fire starting. So you might as well have strategies to create lots of fire starting materials. So that's a good one. When we're using our sparker, um, uh, we tend to uh, have the notion that the knife's always got to be in the right hand and the uh, sparker's always got to be in the left which is okay. Uh, there's lots of techniques we can use. There's, there's uh, five or six or seven ways. I can hold the knife and pull this. I can hold this and strike the knife. I can use uh, my thumb like this just to conserve and use the end. Uh, lots of different techniques. But sometimes if we want to really direct sparks and, uh, and, uh, create, the, and create a lot of pressure, let's switch hands. So we're going to put the knife in this hand. Now we can put the knife. Now you got to be careful with this because this makes sparks hot enough to ruin temper <laughs> in metal. So this is often what's used as a last resort or when you need a lot of really hot sparks focused in a really small place. So uh, lots of pressure. The sparks go exactly where you want them. 
and it's just done by switching hands. Do you use the back of the blade? or? I use the back of the blade, yeah. Yeah, because they're using the other <laughs> in the emergency, uh, but that's why we love the very sharp corners on the back of the blade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if, if, if viewers aren't sure what that means, uh, we, skate, we sharpen the back of our knives. Uh, there's different schools of thought on that, but I mean, you got your knife. There's lots of uses for a squared back on the knife, like a skate blade, removing, removing bark, uh, making uh, fine uh, wood wool, all kinds of things. It saves your, saves your blade. A friend of mine, uh, Jason Gustafsson, he does a technique where you actually make a little match uh, a baby, a, a baby feather stick, and you light the feather stick, and that becomes your match. If you're a smoker or something, you just want to quickly be able to snot one of these up, and then quickly be able to light your pipe or your cigarette without, if all you have is a sparker, without the, without the time and trouble to make a full-on feather stick. So the gig is, though, it's quite unwieldy to figure out how to hold things to get the sparks on your feather stick without actually setting it down on something. If I set it down on that and use that technique, I'm sure I can get lots of hot sparks right where I need. But the issue is it's winter time and you're walling out in the snow and you want to light your fire or light, uh, light your cigarette or whatever it is. So here again is a case of trying to figure out how to hold my sparker and figure out where, how I'm going to make sparks with either my knife or the, or the metal that came with the sparker. Either is fine. But again, I'm going to switch hands. So this is doing it backwards. Now I, now I end up with uh, uh, being able to control the sparks and have them go right where I need them to. And I usually have a much easier time of lighting, uh, of lighting my match. Right? So just that simple little change just by switching hands again. And those Take. little feather sticks are very nice. To, uh, they find an ember in a fire and pick up the pick it up and blow them into the flames. Mm -hmm. uh, get yeah. the next fire away. Yeah, if you, I don't know if you guys hear that, but yeah. So you, using uh, fine shavings is totally, totally acceptable as a tinder bundle for uh, blowing a coal into flames, both with really fine spruce twigs actually and uh, and feathers, feather sticks for sure. Yeah, totally viable way. Now this stuff I'm just spitballing, and this is to get people thinking creatively, and just to, to start to get a little bit of a sense for, for uh, you know, maybe, maybe we think about things wrong. Knife sharpening. The issue people have with knife sharpening is maintaining a consistent angle. It's all about that. So the issue is even on a flat surface, they're taking their knife, when they're getting to the, the unpracticed, when they get to the end of their stroke, they're actually rolling the knife a little bit one way, and they're actually rolling the knife a little bit other way. It's nice to use the full length of your board, but it takes practice to maintain that angle and stay flat on that bevel. Well, here I've got a flat surface, better a table. So how about this? I'm gonna maintain a perfect angle on that blade. Whoa, precision angle. I can sharpen a knife. There's, there's no way that I'm, that, because this is a flat surface, uh, I have boards that don't have emery cloth on the end. And I've got a gorgeous technique. <laughs> I don't move the knife. I'm actually sliding the board because the board stays perfectly flat on the stump. So a sneaky way of getting a precision shot. I can watch the angle, I can see what's going on. Play with it. It's not a be all end all, but if you are having an issue, uh, it takes practice to be able to maintain a gorgeously perfect angle and that's the secret to sharpening, particularly a Scandi grind. Uh, yeah, something to play with. Let's think about things differently. Again, this is just to get everybody's juices flowing. Just what's possible, just the things we can do, things we can think about. Sharpening an axe is always a is always something. It's always a pain because the issue is, particularly out in the bush, at your home on your bench, you clamp the the axe down, and then there's different schools of, of thought where do we sharpen toward the blade or we sharpen away. But it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's always unwieldy. You're trying to figure out how to brace the axe at the right angle and having to to uh, switch it around and those kinds of things. And and again, a, a lot of the success that you have with sharpening your axe comes from your ability to hold a fairly precision angle with your with your file. Well, why don't we turn that on its head? Why don't we say, let's see if we can figure out a way to hold our uh, to hold our file steady. Now this is of course still being played with, but again, this is just to get everybody's juices flowing. If I want, I can actually do both sides. 
again, this is, this is maybe no solution, but the point is, uh, it's now safe. I'm char sharpening toward my blade because one of the issues when you're sharpening, the preferred method seems to be sharpening toward the blade. The chance of nicking your thumb if it's in the wrong place you're getting to your fingers is fairly high and you can see in a good cut. You need to wear gloves. Well, this I've taken away. There's no longer, this isn't a huge ax, so I may do that technique on maybe a forest ax or a boy's ax. It's, it's, it's a little lighter head getting into a bigger ax course. But again, this is just to get people, just get people's juices flowing, just to, just to start thinking about what's possible. We don't always have to be in the box. Is it good? I don't know. You guys play with it at home and then write to us and let us know. I played with it a little bit and I've got some pretty good success. Oh, what else do we have to play with? So uh, we always think again about uh, our knife in our knife hand. We had a student at one of our courses. I think it was it was Ken. I think was it Randy? Uh, he um, he had a hurt wrist and he just couldn't s seem to persevere getting the bark off his saplings for some of our projects. So he started playing around with this, and then a few of us jumped in, and before long, we realized that holy cow! With uh, pounding uh, your knife into the back of a tree, just so we can see that knife that's uh, pounded into the tree. You get that, Rand? Looks okay. Yep. Yeah, so now we can, uh, oh my goodness, I can take advantage of the back of that knife blade and oh, it takes you, uh, Morris can do this sapling in 30 seconds in his prime, but most people it takes about <laughs> 15 or 20 minutes to do one. Well, now all of a sudden, if you needed to do it in a rush, we're capitalizing on that beautiful back of that blade and very quickly uh, uh, using the knife in this fashion to remove the bark, so. When I go to the trade shows and had my knives on display, some potential knife makers would come by and examine my tools. And it's such a common predictable situation. People would pick up the knife and they would feel the corner on the back of the blade that being that sharp and they would say, you know, I don't like my corners that. And of course I smile and say, well, you're not very knowledgeable how useful those two, those corners are when it comes to the scraping and uh, 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 getting a very fine kindling and, and uh, saving the, the razor's edge on the other knife yeah. where if you, you know, it's very brutal on the knife where it's, it's very effective. Yeah. Usually it's the same guy, you pick up a knife and he'll go, uh, the knife will be very contoured to this grip and he'll pick the knife up and go, oh, yeah, oh I, yeah, I really like the grip of that knife. And I always think in my head, well, okay, but what about like this? What about like this? And 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 all these uh, different grips. And I think so. That's uh, you know the worst thing you can do is make it fit one position. Eh? Like yeah. that's a that's a good uh, a good telltale how much a person uses a knife, I suppose. Right there. Ah, eh? uh, well, let's do one more. I do have more. It's just a fun collection of things. Uh, convention conventional fire wisdom, fire making wisdom says that. Uh, when we build a fire, we start with really fine material and then we go a little bit bigger and then we go maybe pencil size and then maybe go maybe finger size and the more trying the conditions, the more that, the more that we graduate our material. And that's all fine and dandy, but in order to use systems like this, you tend to have to use shorter material. It's totally, totally viable, totally 100%, but it's just not the only way. I've had to process, I've had to cut grass, I've had to process twigs like this, I've had to process this, I've had to process this, I've had to process this. Getting up to this size without a saw, I'm trying to break those into pieces and I can't have them too much longer than that because they need to fit on top of my pile and work. I can't really uh, pile long logs on a, on, a, on a pile of graduating material. I can, but it's a lot harder. So let's get rid of this and let's use backward thinking. So instead of thinking about lighting from the bottom up, and think about that for a minute, the, kindle, the, the kindling has to catch, and then in turn like the bigger stuff, and in turn like the bigger stuff, and you don't get the coal establishment until it starts to get to material about like this. And then, and once a fire has coal establishment, well, it starts to generate a lot more heat, and it starts to burn much more efficiently, and more questionable materials will start to burn. Well, why don't we just shortcut all that? And even if we don't have tools, we can walk in the bush and just skid a few, a few trees over. And this can be scaled to any size. This can be scaled for, uh, for uh, this size for, uh, for uh, a meal, or this size for good coals for uh, cooking and baking, or this size for fires that are going to extend, 
or, or logs this size if you if you want to make uh, if you want to try and make something last most of the night. So this case, there's nothing to do. You just simply lay your biggest fuel down first. Minimum of five logs. This works great on snow and and uh, and wet ground in all conditions. And then we just go simply collect a copious amount of kindling. Kindling is something, by Morris's definition, something that will light at, uh, at the count of five or less with a match. If it doesn't light in the count of five, it's either not kindling or poor kindling. So here I've stuffed double the volume of that grass, easy to collect, no processing. And I just grabbed more twigs, easy to collect, very little processing. I light this grass, I set this on this bundle, and instantly this fire gets roaring and intensifies with a lot of heat. And this stuff starts dropping little shards of coals in between where all the logs are catching and those little rows of coals start the, start the uh, logs into burning and coal establishment is mere minutes. If I build a fire like this and I'm using material this big and I use five logs like this and a, and a twig bundle about this size, I just light it, put it down, walk away and come back two hours later and I still have a nice fire. Haven't kicked it, haven't touched it, haven't adjusted it. So minimal amount of tools or no tools and a minimal amount of processing. So again, it's thinking backwards. We're lighting the fire essentially from the top down instead of the bottom up is really what's going on. So I thought this might be a good example too. I read that first, lighting a fire in a wood stove in a Swedish book where you fill the wood box in the kitchen range. You put all the heavy sticks in first and light all the... And I said, oh, <laughs> like, counterintuitive. Well, well the Swedes are really cunning. Oh uh, yes. Because uh, fire lights in a, the, you know, the firebox in a wood range is only about that wide, uh -huh, much uh -huh. and so on. But still, put in the heavy wood and uh, build the kindling on top. Uh -huh. And it's marvelous how that is so much better. So campfire, your wood stove, your bush cookers, your fireplace at home, all the same principles. Yeah, lay your bigger fuel down first in a parallel fashion. Um, and uh, and the, the key is an adequate amount of kindling. So under trying conditions, that system I would graduate, you have more graduations between the steps. In this one, I wouldn't change anything. I would just get double the amount of the kindling because I just, so I create that much more heat, so I create that much more sparks. But it took like mere minutes to, it was a couple of branches off a tree. So, so very minimal work and quickest way to a good fire. The, uh, there's one key thing that, that uh, I, groped for for a long time is the spacing of the fuel ah. and I rode bushcraft and I didn't know what I learned from an Australian actually her husband was was uh, getting his education increased and she came to Canada and she took one of our uh, monk long courses and we had a, a, a water boiling competition she beat me <laughs> and I thought oh that's embarrassing <laughs> and uh, so there I that's where I learned that when we make a twig bundle we know that if we squeeze our stuff together too tightly fire doesn't catch so well because the flames go around the squeezed bundle so we assumed that there has to be some space but we didn't know what that space was well we discovered from her I learned that the space is a finger no matter whether it's a matchstick thick or a hog-sized log, it's a finger, and that that was a big, uh, a big, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a weekend, uh, yeah, catapult. Uh, uh, big insight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's a special name for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other thing that uh, I I all I'll do is with the twig bundle, I give it a haircut. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. then, very often, by the time it's I make brittle. that haircut, that little handful that's uh, left. Um, helps. Uh, so if it's soft, you can fold over the tips and tie them. It's more manageable because uh, yeah. all those ends, they don't participate no. like they should. Now they will yes. participate that much better. So you can, if they're really brittle, you can break them in. If they've got a little flex to them, you can fold them over. And I've used some grass here to lash. So Yeah, yeah. that saves on paracord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. And um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for watching.